Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. I don't know about you, but I try to pride myself on being honest. I try to share my feelings and talk about things as much as possible to make sure everyone knows I am only human. I'm not interested in coming across as perfect. I love talking to other people who have a similar kind of mindset, and my guest today is one of those people. He's not interested in telling you what you want to hear, but instead using his knowledge as a doctor to teach you about how to make yourself healthy rather than just giving you something to treat the symptoms, but never really addressing the true source of the problem. Today I'm talking to Steve Ganjami, also known as the Sock Doc. He is a doctor who focuses on holistic healthcare, focusing on the entire body rather than just the areas that are giving you trouble, to look at why you are having an issue to prevent it from happening again. When I say Sock Doc, it's not what you think. <laughs> he has completed 16 Ironmans and has been a competitive triathlete and runner for most of his life, therefore he understands runners pretty well. He's had training in functional neurology, biochemistry, acupressure, applied kinesiology, and dietary and lifestyle medi- medication methods. Just to warn you, we did drop the call in the middle, but don't worry, we jump right back in there to get back to the conversation and continue our learning. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Dr. Ganjemi. Hey, Tina, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you on. Um, so for those listeners and readers who have not heard of you, could you tell us what the Sock Doc is all about? So uh, the Sock Doc site is about a, uh, a natural injury treatment and prevention uh, blog slash website that I have on, uh, I've had for the past few years, uh, four years actually now. And um, it basically revolves around uh, smart training for both, both uh, or mostly endurance athletes, but really any athlete can gain something from it since there's endurance in almost every sport. Um, but also injury prevention, how to properly deal with injuries if you get injured, how to properly handle them in a natural method if, uh, if you get injured, or especially to prevent them, keep them from coming back or, or, or keep just from being injured in the first place. And uh, how to live a more healthy, natural, stable, high-energy, well-rounded lifestyle. Sounds so. like something that we all kind of strive for, but maybe maybe a lot of us don't take it quite as much as we as we should. So hopefully we're going to learn a lot from you today and uh, find out some new practices to incorporate into our lives. So you, yeah. you state on there that you are 100% holistic. Do you want to explain what that means to our listeners? Sure. Um, so it means that um, I'm really not one to promote even, say, an NSAID like ibuprofen if someone is injured or if someone has a muscle strain or sprain. I'm not one to, uh, you know, recommend a cortisone shot or recommend a, a foot orthotic because someone's foot or gait is out of balance. Um, not that I'm 100% against, obviously, all conventional medicine. There's a time and a place for everything. There's a time to have an MRI done or a, an x-ray, of course. There's a time to take certain drugs like uh, an antibiotic if you're truly sick and, 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 and in big trouble. There's a time to take certain things. And there's a time for even surgeries. Uh, but, but unfortunately, many people jump to these things way too quickly, way too prematurely, and, and they do conventional therapies uh, a, when they don't need to, but B, also when they're not actually understanding the nature of their problem and how they should be addressing the problem. In other words, which I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, if you have an injury, say, of like plantar fasciitis and you decide to go get a cortisone shot or take an anti-inflammatory or put a foot orthotic in or even go and have some release type of therapy there uh, or, or um, surgery, you're really not figuring out why you had the problem in the first place. And a lot of times injuries are not as local as what you may seem them to be, uh, meaning that the injury might not just be where you feel it, but it could be coming from someplace else. And all you're doing is uh, sticking a big Band-Aid on the problem uh, temporarily. And you could obviously be creating other problems that are just going to haunt you later on down the line. 
Yeah, no, that's that's important. And that was one of the things I was actually going to mention. I love that you, you look at the source rather than just treating the symptoms, uh, rather than giving that same old advice of just, you know, trying to cover up what's really what's really wrong with things. Um, and yep. then you said about um, you, you try to, you know, look at the source, you try to look at what is actually causing it um and have you found one area in particular uh you know we we hear a lot about hips but do you hear yeah. of one one specific kind of area that people tend to neglect more than others yeah that's a good question actually because i've, I've as many podcasts as i've done nobody's ever asked me that um you know you don't obviously you know you can't say one area is more important than the mm -hmm. other but you, you know if i had to pick one area and when i teach uh, when I teach students and when I teach doctors, my, my techniques and my theory on health and movement and all that, I, I typically say that the one area that is way under addressed and most people have issues with is actually the shoulder girdle. Really? And yeah, and that would be true for even runners. Um, and I think there's a couple reasons for that. One is that if you think about it, you can go through the day without really having to raise your arms too far above your head. You know, you might comb your hair, wash your hair, and, you know, you really don't need to elevate your shoulders that much and have much scapular motion to do that. Of course, if you have to put something away in a cupboard or reach overhead, you do that. But you, most people don't need to do that throughout the day. You really can get by without really moving your – elevating your shoulder girdle, I should say. You know, and, and, and you, you can have massive restricted scapular motion and, and get by just fine. Now, if you're swimming, of course, like a, a freestyle stroke or, or really any of the strokes, I should say, um, or if you're climbing, um, you know, then then you're going to start using or throwing. Throwing is another one. You know, you're going to start using the scapular motion. But most people don't do these things, um, especially not daily, let alone or I should say not weekly, let alone daily. So I see a lot of scapular type issues and then i think the second issue there is or the second reason is because of the unique and essential gait mechanics between our limbs in a cross crawl pattern which is obviously how we move so there there's a very strong relationship uh and i talk about this in articles on, on the site between you know your shoulders and your hips so you and i really aren't probably seeing too much different things you see hips i see shoulders you know, we're really seeing just different sides of the coin in a way um, of the same of the same thing. So, you know, your your shoulders and your hips, especially the left shoulder and the right hip and vice versa, have to move in harmony with, with one another. The flexors and extensors, you know, when the extensors fly, fire in your glute max, the lower legs and and your, your glute meats, all those extensors on, say, your lower right limb, then the extensors need to fire on your upper left limb on the other side, your lats and your traps and your rhomboids. And that's how you that's how you you move and, and develop power as as, as you uh, as you really do most activities. So and, and then and then past that, you know, you actually your knee and your elbow have to those joints function in harmony with one another, and, and even even your um your wrist and your ankle that a lot of people don't realize they also they also have to function in harmony with one another. So you can I've seen before where someone's had a wrist injury and it's affected their gait by affecting their um their uh their actual foot motion of their muscle and that might sound a little bit strange to some people like oh no that's not gonna happen because you don't walk on your hands you know that would only happen mm -hmm. if you were crawling or or something like that but actually it really can because the pronation and supination of us turning our hands in and out is is a is a in a way a similar motion to the the foot and and uh supination and pronation in your feet and i just tell people you know go walk go walk 10 yards and with your on the outsides of your feet and what, what do you do naturally? You naturally turn your hands out. You naturally supinate them. What do you, That's what true. do you do? Go, go and walk on the inside of your feet, like a, like a, like a knock need. And what do you naturally do? You naturally pronate your hands. So these things work in harmony with one another, but, um, I, I, I'm almost always working on people's shoulder girdles, like their subscaps, especially their serratus, lower traps and rhomboids. I, I'd say those, those two extensors and those two flexor muscles are the most common, uh, injuries or neglected areas that I see that have major uh, effects on the entire body, whether someone's injured or they're just not feeling well or they're not moving well or whatever the situation is. Wow, that's really interesting. And that really, really gives us something to think about is that I, I would never, have, never have guessed that would be what you would say, especially yeah. like you said, with, when it comes to runners. Um, actually, it's funny you bring that up because uh, I've been working with a strength coach the last few months and Immediately when I started going to him, he, he kept 
we kept digging in my shoulders and saying, oh, it's so tight in here. And I, I kept being like, why do you keep picking on my shoulders? Leave my shoulders alone. But, you know, it, I've seen as we've gone through that by, you know, working on loosening that area, it's it's made a big difference to my lower yeah. body. And it, it does affect runners, even if we, we don't think it does. And uh, that's, that's good to know that uh, yeah. if you neglect it, you know, you're kind of confirming what, what I've been discovering myself. So what um, what would you suggest people do? Is there anything they can do if that is a particular problem for them or if they suspect it might be? For shoulder girdle issues? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, um, you know, active and, and, uh, and um, inact or, you know, sort of uh, active and passive hanging is, is really a great way. I have people start. I mean, it depends how strong someone is. You mm-hmm. know, unfortunately, a lot of people can't even just do a dead hang from a bar. Um, and that would be a good thing to start as, even if they can only, you know, hang for two seconds, but then eventually just to do a dead hang and then, you know, a, 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 um, a passive hang and then to do actually an active hang where you're, uh, you know, trying to bring your retract your scapulas and, and, you know, sort of engage your lats and your rhomboids, you know, in other words, like push your scapulas together. I actually have a, I have a shoulder video on, on the sock doc site that's all of a sudden became or just became extremely popular with like 300,000 views now or something like that. I don't know how that happened, but (laughs) in that video at the end, I show, I show active and passive hanging and that's a great way to, to uh, get motion back in your scapulas. And then you can even get to the point when you're good at active hanging uh, to like rotate your shoulder girdles, like in a clockwise or counterclockwise motion. Mm -hmm. And if someone can't do that, then I have my patients even just start with their arms out straight in front of them, like, you know, uh, parallel to the ground, perpendicular to their body. And without trying to move their, their wrists or elbows, actually move their shoulder girdles in clockwise and counterclockwise, nice circular motion. So they're, you know, they're, they're bringing their scapulars back, trying to, trying to rotate them together in in unison. And then, you know, down to like six o'clock up to three and around in a circle like that. Um, and, and, and make circular motions with their scapulas just to start getting movement back in there. Oh, okay. All right. And you said that video, I will put that uh, a link to that on our on our site, which yeah. uh, can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC55. So I'll put a link to that and in addition to your website in general. Um, but okay, so what, uh, what spurred you on to be so, uh, interested and passionate about, um, you know, treating the source of the problem being holistic rather than just, was there a defining moment in your life that kind (laughs) of changed it for you? Um, no, I guess I don't think there was a defining moment. It was kind of like all my, always my personality. Um, I'm just like to figure things out. And I think that, you know, for the most part, I'm not saying there's not a lot of smart medical doctors out there because there, there certainly is, but, you know, just taking a pill to diminish pain or, or, or taking a, uh, you know, throwing an orthotic to temporarily resolve foot pain, you know, there's so many like easy ways to mask a problem and not truly figure it out. So I've always been interested in actually trying to figure out the human body and how it functions and, and not just functions like we just talked about structurally, uh, structural parts to other structural parts. In other words, how joints influence one, on, uh, one another and fascial connections, but also how there is a deep uh, biochemical connection to how our muscles function related to certain nutrients, hormone, neurotransmitter ba- imbalance, and all blood sugar imbalances, of course, you know, all these different things. It's, it's a pretty cool thing that, um, you know, really there's sort of, a, I'm sure, endless, uh, an endless learning experience there, you know. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I loved uh, on your site, you did say that uh, doctor means teacher uh, yeah. and you are teaching us to live a healthier life, which I thought was absolutely amazing and kind of, it shocked me a little bit thinking about, you know, that's <laughs> in theory, that's what a doctor should be. But yeah, that isn't the kind of world we live in right now. So why do no. you think other doctors, any thoughts on why other doctors going to kind of follow this thinking? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to try. Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I want to try and answer that without sounding like a cocky ass, I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, it takes time to do it. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, in, in, in my office, when I see someone, um, the, the visit is anywhere between one and two hours long. So, you know, most doctors, obviously, or, or any therapist, and, you know, with the exception, of course, some 
really good bodywork therapists, like massage therapists, and, and, and even some PTs, they, they don't they don't spend that much time with you. You know, a, a traditional medical doctor, even a chiropractor, or some physical therapist, you might get lucky if you see them for 15 minutes, and if not, just you know, five or 10, if you know, if that. So it takes a lot of time to figure out what's going on with someone, and then, I mean, there's certainly. Uh, sorry about that, guys. We uh, we just lost the call for a second there, so we're just gonna we're just gonna come back to that. Um, so could you carry on from where you were where you were speaking about um, you know taking a lot of time and yeah yeah the, your procedure yeah because what it comes down to is that I mean obviously you know some people can just be fixed through structural modalities. Some people can just be fixed by changing their diet. Some people could just be fixed by changing their lifestyle. You know, stress reduction or sleeping better, that sort of thing. But for a lot of people, especially athletes, um, you know, you got to kind of look at all these things, how it's all interrelated, um, you know, how how your adrenal glands and hormone levels and stress levels affect certain joints in your body and how your diet affects all these things and rest and recover. So I, I guess what I, I, I sometimes tell people, you know, sort of the more I learn, the more I think I or the more I realize I don't know. I mean, it just gets more and more complex of of how a human body functions and how you know, the littlest things can really throw you off. Um, you know, look at in terms of uh, in terms of runners, uh, you know, uh, look at how someone uh, looks before and after a, a race, especially a long race like a marathon or an ultra. You know, sure, they might look depleted, but just look how they stand. You know, I always remember after I would do an Ironman race, I, I have pictures of myself where I thought I was standing straight up and down, you know, straight and really nice posture with, with level shoulders. But my body was completely torqued, you know, my, my left shoulder, some, some pictures, it looks, I'm just, I'm completely crooked. And, you know, these body mechanics, these gait imbalances change, uh, due to, you know, nutritional and chemical changes in your body as you deplete yourself, obviously through dehydration or glycogen, uh, depletion, but also certain, certain nutrient imbalances over time. So, uh, you know, there's a huge, there's a huge reason why someone gets injured. You know, you could have a bad knee because you're wearing the wrong shoes. I could have a bad knee because, um, you know, my shoulder is not functioning well on the opposite side. And someone else could have a bad knee because their diet is riddled with carbohydrates and very little protein and, and no fats. You know, so it, 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 everybody's, everybody can have a, a different reason for the same sort of problem. I think that's a very important point to bring up there, especially as, you know, we tend to, when we do have something go wrong, we tend to kind of look for uh, similarities with others. And we get a lot of questions actually about, you know, can you tell me what's wrong with my, you know, my knee? And, you know, it's, it's almost impossible, especially for us, you know, not even seeing the person uh, to know what is wrong. But you're right, there's so many things that go into it. And, um that's that's great that you actually spend you know like you said an hour one to two hours really like going into all the areas that it that it could be or you know you probably I'm sure you pick up quite a few other things that maybe the person wasn't even aware of oh yeah Is that right yeah yeah I mean that 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 <laughs> happens a lot or or not only that but they think they that it's that it's not something that is related you know so mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen people before and, you know, they, they write down in their history, you know, how many hours a night do they sleep? And some people write like four hours and they think, well, that's that's all I've ever slept and that's OK. Or or, you know, they wake up three times a night to go to the bathroom and they think that's normal. There's there's like so many so many little symptoms that people think are normal, but it's just because they're so common. Everybody has them. But it really means that they've got some major issues going down on, you know. So, yeah. Have you found that runners tend to be a little bit more like that? Because, you know, we, we, we kind of get used to the pain, the pain of things and kind of like ignoring things. Like I've been told I'm, I'm by physical therapists and people that I'm incredibly sensitive to things because I'm so used to the way my body feels that I, I notice some things, but other things that others would get a red flag, I don't even notice because I, you know, I'm used to it kind of thing. Yeah. So um, I, I mean, I think, I think athletes in general are, 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 um, they're good at dealing with certain pain, you know, pushing through it. Um, in terms of how well they may be in like tune with their body, I haven't really ever made a correlation between athletes and, and I guess you could say non-athletes, people who aren't, mm -hmm. you know, is that, you know, saying, you know, everybody's an athlete to some degree, but, you know, meaning the person who really doesn't exercise at all. Some people just tend to be in tune with their body and some people are completely clueless. They, they, they don't realize that something's 
not functioning well or they're just so used to it that they don't pay attention to it anymore. Yeah, yeah, I, I, can, <laughs> you know? I could see that going both ways. <laughs> it, it, it's, kind of, it, it's kind of like the person who, you know, I, I've had people, they, they, they say, well, every time after I eat, I, I get really tired or I, I get sleepy. And they think that's normal, you know, because they ate something and really it was just because they were eating way too many carbohydrates and they're just, they want to mm-hmm. nap 10 minutes after they, they sleep or mm-hmm. after they eat. So I think some people just get really used to certain things. So speaking of that, uh, when you said, you just said about that, what, what is your diet kind of consist of? What are your thoughts on, uh, eat healthy eating? Uh, you know, my, my foundation is really, it was really pretty much paleo based. I, I honestly think okay. that's the best type of diet for, for most people. And then, I mean, that doesn't mean that everybody should have this percentage of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. It means that everybody should be eating. And if you don't want to use the word paleo, then I like to use the word, you know, non or uh, let's say pre-industrial revolution diet, you know, like before we like refined (laughs) everything and started packaging all this stuff and made hydrogenated fats and we still ate butter and, and more real raw unaltered foods. Uh, so I think that's the way to go. And then in regards to, uh, activity levels, then you have to, you know, you have to adjust your diet. I think a lot of people get stuck in the same old diet day after day and they don't change their diet based off in, in this case, runners, they don't base their diet based off of training intensity and, and training duration. So, you know, clearly if you're training harder one day, you should think about eating more carbohydrates. Hopefully that doesn't mean you're just going to go home and load up on pasta, but maybe you're going to eat sweet potatoes or white potatoes or some good, you know, organic rice, something like that, or some fruit. Uh, and the days when you're doing longer, longer runs, hopefully you're eating more healthy fats or, you know, that sort of thing or more protein. So our, our diets need to be adjusted almost every day. You know, we don't want to be eating the same foods every day, first of all, because that's just not healthy, but also dependent on, on our, uh, our training levels, intensity and duration and that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. And I like that you brought, brought up the variety depending on, on levels. And I think that is important as a lot of, a lot of runners kind of get stuck in the trap that they need to, you know, eat, um, eat the same every day Mm -hmm. and then they find that you know the days after hard workouts or long runs they're absolutely ravenous because you know they (laughs) burned a lot more calories than they ate and then that the next day they you know the track their body is saying you give me more i need more Mm -hmm. so i think that's good you brought that up um i'm just gonna ask i know but uh, i know our listeners may not know uh, and i did not ask this at the beginning could you explain sock doc uh where that came from why, oh, sure. why you walk all that <laughs> yeah um basically like four years ago um i was talking to a friend of mine a guy named bill kotowski he's a he's an editor out at uh somewhere out in california and we were just talking about barefoot and minimalism and and that sort of stuff and i had mentioned to him that I don't even wear shoes in my office. I just always wear my socks. You know, I take my shoes off when I get to work and I treat patients all day long and just walk around in socks. And he's like, oh, you should call yourself the sock doc. So it was kind of a cute, catchy name and uh, maybe easier for people to pronounce such as yourself as my last name, Gang <laughs> Chummy. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, so it kind of just stuck. And um, it's kind of funny because... Most people spell it wrong. Um, I'd say more often than not, when I get emails or comments on the site, people spell it S O C D O C, which so I think I've done it a couple times too. I, I don't even actually even wear socks in the office anymore. I, I'm really 100% barefoot. Like today, I just I leave my sandals in the sh- in the in my truck, so when I go to Whole Foods for lunch or something like that, but I just drive and leave the house and, and walk to the office through the parking lot and stay all day barefoot. Uh, but you know. I think all those other barefoot uh, monikers are are taken right now, so I'll stick with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think that definitely works. And uh, just to explain to our listeners of what happened there, when we were uh, in our pre-interview, I was trying to say uh, Steve's last name, and I couldn't quite pronounce it, so we decided to just go with a uh, sock doc. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit more about you, and then I do want to uh, kind of go into some other things. But um, you've run 20 Ironmans, is that correct? Or is that... I've run almost all of them. Stuff? I've dropped out of okay. four of those run portions, but I've done... Uh, okay. Yes, I, I've, I have, yes. 
Okay, and um, you've been injury-free since 1996, is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. Maybe a little bit before then, but I've never, you know, I, I, I would never say I don't have like aches and pains where, you know, I've got a little cork mm -hmm. here that might, you know, keep me from doing what I want to do one day. But I've never had, I've never been to the point where I've been injured to the extent that I can't do something or needed some, uh, you know, major intervention, you might say. Okay, and what do you uh, attribute this to? Is there anything, or what things would you say that have uh, contributed to that? Um, I would say overall, if you had to pick one thing, I would just say overall healthy lifestyle, and but that would obviously include uh, smart training, you know, building a really solid aerobic base and not just training high intensity all the time, or especially what people, you know, call chronic cardio, which is high intensity and long duration at the same time, training way too intense for way too long, which I would include or consider over two hours for something like a run or two and a half hours. Um, and, um, and especially eating well, I mean, really it, it comes down to, uh, aside from lifestyle or part of lifestyle is, is, is how smart you train and how smart you eat. And I, I wouldn't put percentages on any, any of it. It really depends on the person because you can train 90% smart and eat and 10% of your diet is terrible. And that can affect one person and someone else can get away with a little bit of a, a poor diet and, and train, um, and train uh, really well and still be still be injured. Likewise, some people have to be more specific than others on their training. So it's definitely individualized, but it comes down to how well you train and how well you uh, how well your diet is. I should say. No, I was going to say eat, but obviously it's food and drink, uh, and 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 consume uh, consume not just the proper ratios of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, but you're also eating nutrient dense foods and and that sort of stuff. So it, it, it's an overall thing. I, I'm not. I'm not one to say that, um, even though I'm, I'm a big barefoot advocate and, uh, and a minimalist shoe advocate, and I truly believe that humans, all humans can get by with, um, or should be able to wear little to nothing under their feet, except if they will, if, except for protection when needed. Or of course, I'm not against style. If you want to go out on the town for the night to throw on some, <laughs> some boots or some high heels at, at certain times, I'm not all against that, but for people who are on their feet, uh, runners, of course, we're talking about then, um, you know, I mean, less is more when it comes to that. And I, I truly believe that there is a, a strong link between wearing the wrong type of footwear and uh, increasing injuries in, in, in runners. Why is that? Do you think that is? I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just curious what you what your thinking is behind that. Well, the easy answer to that is because it throws off gait mechanics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so like overstriding and things. Yeah, I mean, obviously you got the heel strike when you're wearing something under your foot, but also, I mean, most shoes are going to support the arch, which, or, or I, sh I, I don't want to misinterpret say that wrong. They think they're going to support the arch. Really, what they do is they weaken the arch, they fatigue the arch, because the only way to actually support someone's arch like any arch, including one that, you know, like a bridge or a span of something man-made is to support the beginning and the end of the arch. And in, in case of the human foot, it would be, you know, the heel and the ball of the foot. Uh, and you, you do this by strengthening those areas. Uh, you know, a typical footwear, obviously an orthotic or, or insole or arch support is going to push, push up on the arch. And then, you know, the arch basically fatigues over time. And when that happens, then you start to overpronate, you lose the balance of, of the foot and you end up, uh, you know, displacing uh, stress and force in all the wrong areas, and then you end up with either a foot issue or the or the impact is is further uh, transferred up to the knees, the hips, or even all the way up to your neck. So, you know, the the footwear has a major or can have a major impact for most people. And of course, some people can get away with you know the worst shoes in the world, and I won't throw out names, but you know, and 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 but what happens is the the opposite is is typically, you know, people they want to go to or, or think they're ready for a, a very minimalist shoe, whether that's like a four millimeter drop or, or a zero drop, and they feel worse, meaning they, they don't feel as good wearing it. They might have foot pressure or pain. They might have a, they might start to develop an injury, and it's just because their foot is not strong enough or their body is not healthy enough to wear that shoe at that time. It's not just something that everybody can can jump into and start – uh, walking or running in in a very uh, a very minimal type of footwear. Mm -hmm. So if someone was going to make that transition and they were interested in kind of moving towards minimal, do you have any any suggestions for them? 
Yeah, I mean, it really it, it always depends on the person, but I'm you know you have to transition these things out. I mean, the, the longer your heel is elevated in a shoe, meaning over years, your Achilles definitely definitely tightens mm-hmm. up. It definitely shortens itself. I mean, I remember the first time I went for a, a kind of long barefoot run on the road. I would say it was probably thirty or thirty five minutes. You know, the next day my Achilles were super sore. You know, because they're starting to naturally stretch out, naturally elongate. So you don't want to injure yourself, um, of course or do too much too often. If that happens, you know, then you got to take a couple of days off, maybe put your other shoes back on. And, and it really depends on where you started from. If you're starting with a, a super, you know, traditional shoe, 12, 15, 17 millimeter drop, you know, from the back of the shoe to the front, you don't want to just hop into a four millimeter shoe right away. You know, you sort of have to transition down there and, and do it, you know, as comfortably as you can, uh, as, you know, depending on, you know, how how strong your feet are to begin with if if, if you're wearing one of these thick shoes because your feet are just super weak and super unstable uh you know the more you stay in those shoes the longer that's going to happen anyway so if you start wearing a shoe that that makes your foot work harder then that's exactly what's going to happen and, and you can um you know you can be in some discomfort for, for a while and, and obviously some people get injured from that you know because you're supporting the shoe almost like an embrace like device for so long you just can't take this stuff off and expect the foot to be ready to go for you mm-hmm. no and i think that's that's good that's good points there and i think uh you definitely uh hit on the major one of you know doing it gradually yeah. i actually uh came out of orthotics myself yeah uh, three or four months ago and i i was shocked how quickly <laughs> how quickly it felt better i mean i um i gradually brought them out but it was within two or three weeks I felt like my, That's good. I felt more comfortable not wearing them than I did wearing them and I couldn't believe how quickly I felt better with it and uh, so yeah I, I definitely I'm glad I'm out of them now <laughs> yeah well, 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 well me too because I actually wouldn't have done this interview if you were still wearing orthotics you know <laughs> cut it off right now that's right it's, it's, it, no, it, it's a prerequisite if you wear a thought it's, it's not gonna happen no no i, I i'm i'm l- glad to be out of them and uh, uh to be honest for it was probably two or three years i wanted to get out of them but i was scared that i would end up injured if i did so hey, I- hey li- listen you know i i tell people it's I mean, I started, I learned to make orthotics when I was still in high school because I, I was, I wanted to be a physical therapist and a friend of mine, a runner friend of mine was a physical therapist. He showed me, I mean, the traditional old way too, of like using the plaster of Paris to, to, mm-hmm. you know, mold to the foot. And then when I went to chiropractic school, I mean, that was a big thing in chiropractic school of learning to make mm-hmm. orthotics different ways, different foams. And, and I mean, the technology is so much more advanced now than it was, you know, 20 years ago, uh, but, and I wore orthotics all the time, you know, I, I, I bought into it, custom orthotics, you know, this is going to mold to my feet. It's going to be better. I had them in my cycling shoes. I have obviously had them in my running shoes. You know, I mean, I thought they were the greatest things on earth until I, you know, really saw what they do. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, I bought it okay, in the store. Well, that's good. Good for people to know. And so you said you, you run barefoot. Is that every time you run now you run barefoot? Even? No, no, definitely not. I mean, if I'm on okay. some, if I'm on some trails, I mean, I, I've run barefoot on trails, but you know, here in North Carolina, we have these like thistles and, <laughs> and they don't really hurt, but you get like little splinters in your yeah. feet and then they like, and then you run barefoot later, you just stand it. it you're literally getting like almost like little wood splinters in your feet yeah. and it's not yeah. good. It's, they drive you nuts no. and then you got to try and get them out and, um, but I mean, I try and do it on the trails as much as possible. I run a lot more barefoot on the road, but it depends where I'm going. I mean, you know, if I'm running through town and I know it's not the safest place, I don't, but, um, I would say if I'm running five times a week, probably two of those are barefoot. And if I'm on the trails and I have my shoes on usually, and, uh, you know, sometimes on the road, okay. I'm walking, right. I'm, one... I'm walking mostly barefoot and standing mostly barefoot, like okay. meaning like 95% throughout the day. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's good to know. And uh, one more question about you. Um, you said about uh, you know too many people run too hard or too you know too hard too long, and we we actually talk about that a lot on Runners Connect. How you know most injuries, most overtraining, everything comes from people running too hard on their easy days and things like that. So, but just curious, do you wear a heart rate monitor when you run to keep yourself uh, in a lower intensity zone, or if you trained yourself to to know? what's easy enough for you yeah i mean you know I've, I've been training for i mean competitively for 25 years almost now so i mean i i would say i almost always wear a heart rate monitor if i'm going out just for an easy you know hour run i, I don't put it on i mean and and if i'm on a trail um you know around here a lot of times i don't even wear a watch 
I'll just go out and go with how I feel and kind of have an idea of how long I'm running. Uh, so okay. I've kind of gotten out of the technology a little bit. Um, so, but, but I mean, I always, I mean, I think, I think a heart rate monitor is a necessity for almost everybody because obviously people run too hard and, and they're, they're, they're surprised. They think the heart rate monitor is broken and they see their heart rate, you know, is 180 when they should be turning into like a 140 or something like that. So it's a really good biofeedback uh, device to understand how, uh, you know, how, how you should be training. And, but so I'll, I'll typically always put it on though, when I really need to make sure, um, if, if I'm, if I want to make sure that I'm recovering after something, or if, especially if I want to, um, if I'm doing like hills or something like that, and I want to recover in between each set or, um, or, you know, each interval or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've kind of, yeah. I've kind of not worn it as much as I used to. Okay. Well, we, we, uh, you're encouraging people to wear, wear it so that they don't have to come in and see you because then they stay healthy and That's right. there's less, <laughs> yeah. less reason for you to uh, treat them then. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit and, uh, talk more about, you know, we've, we've discussed so far about how, uh, you know, you're into holistic treatment and, you know, you want to treat the source rather than just uh, sticking a bandaid on. Um, and you know, you are currently at the stage where we kind of want to get a pill to fix everything and we want to, you know, get the easy, easy way out for everything. Do you, do you know why, do you have any theories on why this is or what we can do to change it in the future? So you're basically asking what has happened to our society that we have become so, yeah. this lazy. <laughs> this is how lazy we become. Um, I mean, we're in a quick fix, high technology. Let's, let's see how many things we can do. You know, what's the latest and greatest. And, uh, you know, people want to just, uh, I mean, that's how we live. So, um, I, I, I'd have to say that's my answer. You know, people don't want to wait to recover people. You know, if, if you said, you know, I can give you this cortisone shot and you're going to be running later today rather than, okay, here's how we got to figure this out. You know, this muscle's off. We need to do this. And this is going to take a couple of weeks, but you know, it, people don't want to wait for that. Uh, it, it's easy just to keep, you know, running and gunning, as I say, mm-hmm. and, uh, and just do something to, to, um, to get going. I mean, I mean, look at people, people take, take a pill to sleep or they drink alcohol to sleep, to chill out at night, or people take a pill yeah. to get up in the morning or they drink coffee. I mean, people are medicated all day long. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they take an antidepressant to make them feel good. They take an anti-anxiety to chill them out. They take, uh, you know, a hormone to keep their hormone, you know, whether that's a birth control method or a hormone replacement method for, for a female, that they take hormones every day to regulate their cycles. Uh, it's, it's pretty crazy if you think about it. So we're, mm-hmm. we're in such a, a drug use world here. Um, yeah, I wrote this article on Sock Duck a few years ago. It's called, uh, are you, I think it was called everybody's on drugs. It was basically, I wrote it after the whole Lance Armstrong thing, you know, in 2011, mm-hmm. I think it was, uh, not that I'm for what he did, of course, but, um, you know, my point was, is that you have so many athletes today, athletes who you're racing against athletes who I'm racing against, they're on drugs. I mean, they're taking some drug typically to enhance their performance. That might be something like mm-hmm. an asthma inhaler to bronchodilate their, their, themselves a little bit more to, to get maybe a little bit more airway in their lungs, or they might be, they might be jacked up on caffeine, which of course is a drug to give them some ergogenic aid to, to some athletic boost. Uh, you know, they, they could be taking any sort of a Adderall or a, or a beta blocker to relax their heart. I mean, most people are taking some drug and they might say, mm-hmm. well, that's because of my health condition. I need this. Well, you know, of course my response is, do you really need it? Or are you just too, uh, I don't want to say lazy because I get it that some people just don't know how to correct the problem or, you know, there's truly some genetic things and some people have problems that can't be taken, you know, that, 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 you know, might need some medication, but most people don't know how to, or don't have the means to understand and address their problem. So they just stay on a drug and therefore they say, well, I need this medication. You know, I need this, you know, the guy who says I need this testosterone level because my levels are low, not rather than figure out why they're not making it or why they're depleting it. You know, I, I need this, I need this drug to, uh, to focus at work because, you know, I can't focus and that's what I need rather than, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't be, uh, you know, swallowing 10 diet Cokes during the day and that's what's jacking me up. So yeah, I could keep yeah, on no, going I, on and on yeah. if you can't tell. <laughs> no, no, I, I can see. And, and I think, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's impossible to know what the real solution is to this, but I think, you know, people like you spreading the word that, you know, that this isn't, sh- shouldn't just be a quick fix. And if you're, if your body, if something is wrong, then something is wrong. It's not, it shouldn't be something that you can just quickly, you know, 
like you said, take a cortisone shot to get yourself to run later. And I, and I, I admit, I've been guilty of that, you know, kind of putting um, this season's running ahead of the rest of my life mm. in the past. But it's at the end of the day, you just have to realize that it's your your overall health is, is the most important thing there is. So yeah. I think it's it's good that you, you put that first. So I want to uh, ask you just a little bit, you mentioned it earlier briefly about um, ibuprofen. But um, there's a few things I want to ask you about this. Um, firstly, could you just kind of explain your thoughts on ibuprofen? You know, people seem to jump to that very easily if something's wrong or, you know, you hear of people doing it before workouts, after workouts, any t- anything that hurts. Could you sure. just explain a little about Yeah, that? I mean, it's, it's one of the most abused drugs out there, isn't it, today? Um, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, the, it's the whole NSAID, the whole non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug class, which is ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, things like Aleve, and good old aspirin uh so um what's my thoughts on those um pretty much way overused uh, way overused do i think that any athlete should ever be using them and really the answer is no i mean that was my most recent uh, uh, article on the yeah, sock doc so i mean I'd, i would never tell someone to use those i mean that would be a sellout for me and i'm, I'm not i wouldn't do it just because i don't think because i want to ruin my track record i should say but actually I can't really think of a time where that would truly benefit someone. And I don't mean benefit in regards to, okay, it helped diminish their pain because obviously that happens with a lot of people. They have a lot of inflammation. Their biochemistry isn't working properly. They they don't have the proper prostaglandin, these, you know, these hormones, uh, inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, pro and anti-inflammatory hormones uh, working properly. So they take these drugs to balance or help balance what's somewhat out of balance in their body rather than try and figure out why the imbalance is there. You know, but there was this thing, you know, and I remember being in school and, and, and there was some supposedly some research out there that said, well, within 48 hours after an injury or within 48 hours after an injury, you know, taking an anti-inflammatory can greatly speed up the injury without, you know, healing without any side effects. And, I have yet to find out where the hell that study is. And <laughs> someone recently, a well-known coach, uh, therapist, I believe, too, online, who a lot of people follow, he, he, wrote, he wrote this recently. And I said, well, that's interesting. And then I looked at his sources and I, to the art, to what he was saying. And the source is complete bogus. I, I even put it on that, that NSAID article that I just wrote. Uh, it's, not even, it's not even talking about how it helps compared to – well, it's not even talking about how it helps after an injury. It's comparing it to another drug. So, mm-hmm. you know, there really is no benefit to these things. I, I get it if you had a massive type contusion that might be life threatening, or if you needed to use an aspirin to help, you know, pros- possibly ward off like a deep vein th- thrombosis or something like that, some vascular issue. I'm not saying never take these. And of course, I'm not telling listeners to stop what they're taking. We can't do that. Um, but, you know, you, you, for the most part, people who have just the daily nagging injuries, or even if it's an acute bad injury or, or a chronic ailing injury, taking an NSAID daily is a really bad idea. All you're going to do is, 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 further, is further throw off uh, the balance between pro and anti-inflammatories in your body. You're going to deplete your liver and your joints of sulfur greatly, which is how you repair your cartilage. Um, You're going to screw up how you detoxify hormones because you need sulfur to do that. Um, There's just, you know, of course you destroy your gut. Um, You know, people now know that it really causes, um, you know, like increased permeability in in your digestive tract. I mean, there's, there's, there was one study, a guy I think was taking blood during an ultra marathon or after, right after, you know, he saw that these athletes who were taking, you know, ibuprofen at the aid stations of, of the marathon, the ultra marathon, they literally had, you know, fecal material in their blood you know because they were and of course you know they were dehydrated and the other stresses associated with the ultra marathon so you know there's really not a reason for an athlete to be taking these i mean i I don't care if you're injured or you just got injured and you think you think taking ibuprofen is the right thing to do it it really isn't go take some go take some natural anti-inflammatories like some some high-grade fish oil go take some turmeric or some some uh, ginger or some something like that you know and 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 hit it that way and, and 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 address why you got injured. 
-hmm. So once again, you think, you know, coming, bringing it through your diet, through those anti-inflammatory foods that you mentioned, doing it naturally rather than, you know, going, again, going to a pill to solve the problem. That, that's good advice there. Yeah, and the thing is, is what, you know, this doesn't happen overnight because obviously it, it goes back to like, why did someone get injured? Okay, well, so let's say you're out for a run and all of a sudden you, you, your foot starts to hurt and then, okay, not that bad. The next day it's a little bit worse. Then you got a couple days it's better. And all of a sudden, you know, so you got, let's say, plantar fasciitis, right? Like a really common running injury. Well, you know, you, you tip, you, you basically can't just start, okay, okay, I need to change my diet. I'm going to stop all the white sugar. I'm going to stop all the processed stuff. I'm going to eat more healthy fats. I'm going to eat more, you know, whole organic, you know, nutrient dense foods. And the plantar fasciitis is just going to like go away the next day. I mean, it takes time, you know, even three to four weeks for your biochemistry to really change to develop mm -hmm. these natural and, you know, anti-inflammatory compounds. So that's a lot, a lot of work. And, you know, people, you, it's kind of an unknown for most people, you know, like, mm -hmm. is this even going to help? Well, I can just take a pill and, you know, get to that quicker, even though the end results aren't going to be nearly as good and obviously a lot more risk to it. But the thing is too, let's say you had an injury that you just got unlucky, you know, you're out for a run and you, you, you slip on a rock or you twist your ankle, you land in a hole, whatever, but you actually sustain like a, like an accidental or traumatic type injury, if you're already, if your biochemistry is already superior, you know, you already have a lot of, uh, a lot of things going for you, a, a lot of healthy, um, fats in your body, a lot of, of healthy hormones and, and everything's working really well. And that, and then you sustain that injury, you're going to recover a whole lot faster. You know, it's kind of like that person, you know, it's, they usually blame it on genetics. They say, oh, you know, well, you, you injured that even if you broke a bone. I mean, I've had friends who have broken bones and they're out of cast, you know, in three to four weeks rather than the standard six weeks or they, you know, someone sprains an ankle and they're out running again, you know, two weeks later rather than three, four, six weeks later because their body was already um, healthy enough to be dealing with this problem literally as soon as it happened, you know, not this huge lag time as they decide to change their diet. Or, or their training intensity. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's a very important point to bring up that, you know, it's not, it's again, it's not a quick fix. Even if you did decide to do it the right way, you can't just expect to, uh, you know, <laughs> take those foods and, like you said, the next day feel better. So speaking of that, um, could you share with us maybe your greatest success story that you've come across, you know, maybe a, a turnaround point that our listeners could be inspired by that, you know, you... Sure. Uh, you really made an impact on someone's life. Um, geez. Um, how, 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 how about I tell you this? Because, I mean, I have lots of good stories. Um, you yeah, know, I'm sure. I mean, my, my practice, just so you and the listeners know, it's not it's not an entirely athletic-based um, practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 yeah. I'm kind of a family practice because I see actually a lot of kids with with uh, with like asthma, and I see a lot of people with auto, I, a lot of my practices with autoimmune diseases like uh uh, lupus and, 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 um, Hashimoto's like thyroid conditions. I, I see people with cancer. I see, I see a whole range of things. So to answer your question on success, um, in terms of athletes and people in general, um, and, and one of the best advice that I could ever give anybody to really change their health is to, um, eat more good fats. And, and, and my favorite fat that I've seen literally change people's lives is one you you probably won't guess because most people would say fish oil and then they would say coconut oil and then they maybe see olive oil but actually i think the most neglected fat out there is um is butter uh by mm. far i have literally seen um my my most success stories which you're asking about uh or some big ones that, that i always like to tell stories on are due to people actually starting to eat butter and, uh, yeah, you can do heavy cream too. You can even maybe even do ice cream if it's not crazy high in sugar. That's the one kids always like. Um, <laughs> but actually getting those fats in your diet have a dramatic effect on people's health, their hormones, uh, anti-inflammatory levels, all these things. Um, I, oh. I, I think because saturated fats are super stable, but also butter is high in what's called arachidonic acid, which is only found in animal fats. You can get it in grass fed beef. You can get it in egg yolks. Um, and you can obviously get another dairy products where the fat is still there, but butter seems to be um, the most prevalent, and um, it, it works really well when um, you know when someone's eating at least two tablespoons a day, if not more. I mean, you know, when, when I make French toast for my kids, um, you know, the three of us and myself, and we we eat a whole stick of butter between the four of us, if not more. Uh, and I'll sometimes use a half a stick myself, which is four tablespoons. Um, yeah, it's, it's the, the arachidonic acid 
that type of fat in in the butter in in the in the in those animal fats is actually really superior for your immune system and it has it ends up making something in your body called uh, a prostacyclin which is a really good way for your body to handle inflammation um, you can also get that somewhat through um through ginger and i believe things like resveratrol which is you know like high in like red wine and that sort of stuff but butter is big time neglected and it seems to be the one fat that i recommend more and more people to eat uh over fish oil wow that's amazing and actually you know you say that that makes me think my uh my grandma is about to turn 98 yeah are you and, uh... are you irish I'm English. <laughs> English, I was close. I, I live in America, but I'm English. Yeah. Um, but she's about to turn 98, and the amount of butter she puts on her toast and stuff, yeah. it always just make, made my mouth drop. But maybe maybe that was the secret all along. She. Uh... <laughs> That's right. So you, you, you better start now, you know? Yeah. No, I, I actually do like butter. So well, like I, one, I'm, one, I'm one of the best butters that is that Kerry Gold stuff. You know, you can, you okay. know, you can get it at Costco yeah, yeah. or Whole Foods. It's kind of, it's expensive because mm-hmm. it's, mm-hmm. you know, those cows are just hanging out on these nice lush grass, you know, <laughs> non-sprayed fields. Uh, but it's, it's yeah. like the best stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, okay. So uh, just to finish off, um, if someone wanted to kind of really give this a go and approach it correctly, like really, you know, dip, give themselves a good chance of being healthy and uh, doing everything they can. Could you give maybe three ways they can get started with this? Sure. Obviously butter could be one if you wanted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think, well, yeah, let's definitely put butter as one, you know, and as long as, long as you don't have a dairy, you know, some people who have a dairy allergy can still eat butter. Mm-hmm. Um, I see it to be more often that's the case than not, even though there's like mm-hmm. 20% of milk protein, I think it is in butter. Um, some people can't, so you got to see how you digest it. Um, but and, and just to reiterate on that, Lando Lakes butter and like some of these really cheap processed butters, they don't you won't get the same effect. You really do need to eat organic butter. And and, okay. and if you if if you, and if you can, then you get organic uh, uh, cultured butter, you know, like okay. like that's available today. I should say pasture raised, you know, grass fed cultured butter. Um, so that would be one. Uh, the second thing would be to um, to be maybe more difficult than just eating butter would just be to, to train with a heart rate monitor and train smarter. Um, you know, realize mm-hmm. that most people, most runners are training. They're, 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 they're combining high intensity with long duration. Mm-hmm. And that's why all the, all these CrossFit high intensity fanatics out there, they all, they all call us runners, uh, you know, that we all do chronic cardio because they just see us, you know, train at a super high heart rate for a super long duration. And all we do is beat the hell out of our bodies. But, you know, our, humans are meant to withstand long durations of endurance. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, people don't have the time or sometimes the knowledge to develop that endurance. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like back to the quick fix. You know, we don't put in the time to to figure out things out. We'd rather take a pill. We also don't have a time to really develop sustained aerobic endurance, you know, meaning, mm-hmm. you know, where you're, where you're, uh, you know, you're developing that aerobic system over, uh, you know, weeks, months, years, uh, based off a lower aerobic fat burning type heart rate. Uh, yeah. so that'd be my second one. So we got the butter and, and the heart rate training. Um, hmm, the third one, I was thinking of throwing in the shoes there, but you know, I, I'm not as shoe crazy as some other shoe crazy people out there. So I don't think I'd maybe <laughs> put that in my top five, but I don't think I'd put that at number three. Um, I would have to go back only because I think diet is so important. I would have to say that um, the third most important thing you could do is, is get rid of hopefully all, or at least most of the white stuff, the white sugar and flowers, you know, the refined foods out there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not anti sugar. I, I, I believe in, you know, you know, someone can eat something with some, or at least use like coconut sugar or, or, uh, you know, some very little processed type sugar, rather just some white refined Dixie crystals or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, you eat, you know, you eat like 85% dark chocolate rather than a Hershey's bar. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't put um, you don't put sugar on something. You try and use a little bit of honey or maple syrup, that sort of thing. You know, just making small changes like that. Stop eating, stop eating bread and stop eating, uh, you know, pasta. Stop eating all these white refined foods just because they have such dramatic impacts on our um, on our health and on our fitness. So, mm-hmm. I, I would say that would have to be in the, the top three um, before I would start to look at other things like footwear and and sp- more specific fitness training ideas. 
Okay. All right. Great. So um, just to finish off, uh, I'm just going to give you a question that um, I give all the guests that come on the show. So if you could give me one word to describe what you would like to become, accomplish or achieve this year, what would it be? Um, I would like to, I think the word would be inspire. I would like to Great. inspire people to realize that you, that, that a human body can actually achieve these things. You can actually, um, you know, get out of your crazy thick running shoes. You can actually get through your day without five cups of coffee. You can actually, um, you know, develop an aerobic system so you can run longer and eventually harder. You know, you are, the human body is an amazing thing and, and you can actually do these things a hundred percent naturally. And as you're doing them, feel, feel, you know, re regain your health and regain your mm -hmm. fitness and take it to the next level. So yeah. I hopefully my sight inspires people to do this and, um, and it, it opens their eyes and, and makes them realize that there's a lot more out there than just, uh, you know, training hard every day and not sleeping well and popping a pill to, to hunker down and get through the next day. <laughs> no, that's great. And, uh, yeah, I will definitely put a link up to everything we've talked about in addition to your website, uh, which can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC55. So thank you very much for coming on the show today. I've really learned a lot and it's been absolutely fascinating to hear from you. So thank you, uh, Thank you, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. I appreciate it. What a great interview, huh? Whoever thought butter would be his biggest suggestion? I'm pretty happy to hear that. I don't know about you. The topics from today's episode, as well as the links to the SockDoc website, can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC55. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I would really appreciate if you could leave us a review on iTunes. On the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC55, there is a video demonstration of just how you can do that. It would really help us rise up the rankings and we would really appreciate it. I promise it won't take very long at all. Thank you so much in advance. Have a wonderful week.